Mister, you just scared a year's growth out of me. Shut up and get off of that horse. Just what do you got in mind? I want your horse. Well, now, you ain't got the politest way in the world of asking for it. Quit jawing and get off of that horse. No, I don't believe I will, unless you think you're a man enough to come down here and pull me off. I don't have to come down there. I can shoot you out of that saddle from right here a dang side easier. You mean you'd actually shoot a man just for a horse? I declare. Outside of me, you're about the talkingest person I ever seen. Now, I'm just going to give you a count of three to get off of that horse. One, two... back into bed. I'll tear you apart with my bare hands. Look, you may be a wildcat when you're well, but right now you ain't got enough strength to, to fight a sick rabbit. Maybe some of Hop Singh's stew will fix that up. What's all these fancy diggings? This is a Ponderosa ranch. That's where I live with my Paul and two brothers. How'd I get here? Well... After you tried to shoot me off of my horse and steal him, you passed out from that leg wound. I brought you here. The doctor in Virginia City dug that out of your leg. You gotta give me my clothes and get me on my horse. I gotta get out of here. If you ain't the honorest creature I ever run into, would you like it better if I'd have left you out there on the trail to have died? I'd have left you. You're a liar. Nobody calls me that if I was able to walk around while I'd... But you can't walk, and you ain't gonna be able to for a couple of weeks. The doctor said very few men could have lived through what you went through. You're a tough one, all right. I am, so don't you go calling me no liar. I'll go get that stew. Maybe it'll help your disposition. By the way, what's your name? Jim. Smith. All right. Jim, stew coming up. Just as cantankerous as he was out on the trail. Hop Singh! Yes, Mr. Hart? Hop Singh, do me a favor, will you? Take a bowl of that good stew of yours up there to the sick man. He's powerful hungry. All right, Mr. Hoss. Yeah, Hop Singh. You might better make it a double portion. Yes, sir. Just like you, Mr. Hoss. <laughs> right. uh, what are you going to do with that big moose, Hoss? Yeah, we kind of missed you today. Lifting all them fence rails sort of tired me out. Well, he ain't gonna be here long, and that's for sure. He tried to talk me into tying him onto a horse so he could ride out of here. She sure seems to be in a hurry to get away, doesn't he? Unless he tries to steal your horse, and... I'd be careful of him if I were you. I can handle him, Paul. What happened to him? Who is he, anyway? Well, all he told me was that his name was Jim Smith. Oh, Smith? That's an unusual name. Well, I would suggest you go around calling him a liar, little brother. Well, if I do, I'll stand behind you.
You big cantankerous, hard-headed bull. You that blame tired of packing you around. Howdy, Cal. Howdy, Van. You know my lawyer, Jed Nelson? Certainly. Howdy. My son, Hoss. How do you do, Mr. Cartwright? Well, why don't we go in the house and have some coffee? No, no thanks, uh, Ben. We're out here on urgent business. Oh, well, what can I do for you? We understand you've got a wounded man in there. The doc told us. Oh, yeah, he sure is wounded. Jim Smith. Jim Smith? It's Jim Layton. He says his name is Jim Smith. Well, I don't care what he says. It's Jim Layton. Name's got quite a reputation behind it. Well, you can add two more words to it. Thief and a murderer. How do you figure that? Because he stole $10,000 worth of my pelts and killed my partner to cover up for it. There are pretty strong accusations, Mr. Stacy. Can you prove them? As Mr. Stacy's lawyer, perhaps I can explain. Mr. Stacy's in a partnership with a fur trader out of St. Louis by the name of Amos Carter. He invested rather heavily with him in an expedition to gather beaver pelts from up north. And they hired this Jim Layton as a hunter and a scout. So yesterday he dragged himself into Virginia City, claiming that they were attacked by Paiutes. The Carter had been killed. When I found Jim yesterday, he had a bullet in his own leg. I know. I helped the deputy put it there when he broke jail. So if you'll just turn him over to us, we'll take him back to Virginia City and see if we can get to the bottom of what happened to Amos Carter. No, no. First place, he's too badly wounded to move. All right, we'll get the sheriff and make it official. I don't see why you want to protect a thief and murder and half breed. That's enough, Mr. Stacy. We'll do this through legal channels. Good day. Paul, do you think I did the right thing? Yeah, you did the right thing. Man is too badly wounded to be moved. The old Jim's a legend in his own time, ain't he? Yeah, well, the trouble with being a legend is that a man is liable to outdo himself trying to live up to it. Let's get to work. If you don't mind, I'm going to go up and talk to Jim. I'll be back in a minute. I want to ask you something. Did you break out of jail in Virginia City? There ain't a jail in the world can hold Jim Layton when he sets his mind to get out of it. Last night, you told me your name was Jim Smith. Last night, I wanted to get out of here, and you wouldn't let me. If you ever lie to me again, I'll beat you to a pulp the first time you're able to stand up. Why don't you just go stick your head in a rain barrel if you can find one small enough to fit it? Anyhow, what do you care what happens to a half-breed? Jim, when that doctor and I took the slug out of your leg, your blood looked the same as everybody else's to me. Glad to see you. Want some coffee? No, thanks. I was just getting ready to come out to your ranch. Yeah, I know. That's that's why I came in here. About Jim Layton, huh? Yeah. Clem, how come you to throw Jim in jail? Just because Carol Stacy asked you to? Hoss, if I hadn't known you for so long, I might take offense at that remark. Sorry. I put him in jail for his own protection. Stacy was kind of riled up. I don't trust any man, especially when there's 10,000 at stake. Clem, let me ask you something. Do 
you think that Jim Layton stole those belts? Well, I don't know, Hoss. I got my men scouting in the country looking for Amos Carter. And I'm reserving judgment until we find him or not. I'll find some evidence of what happened to him. But until then, I want Jim Layton to stick around. Even if I have to put double bars on his cell door this time. Sheriff? Cal here said he saw Mr. Cartwright coming into town, so we thought we'd drop over. Have you decided to give him up, Mr. Cartwright? Nope. I just came in to tell Clem that I thought Jim was too sick to move. Besides, Jim Layton tells me he didn't kill Amos Carter. Just his saying so doesn't make it absolutely true, Mr. Cartwright. Nope. And just because you say he did doesn't make that absolutely true either, Mr. Nelson. Everybody knows what he's like. His mother's a Crow Indian. Or he even brags about spilling some white men's blood. <laughs> he's got jail records all over the country. Still doesn't mean that he killed Amos Carter. Well, I think he did. And I think he's got $10,000 worth of pelts cashed away somewhere. He denied that, Cal. Sure he did. Jim Layton would deny a hundred things for a dollar, let alone $10,000 worth of pelts. But until I get some evidence, either on Carter or the Furs, it's your word against his, huh? You mean you're gonna let him stay out there at the Ponderosa? Haas says he's too sick to be moved. I do think he'd be safer in jail, Sheriff. Well, I think he'd be safer on the ranch. You got my word for it, he ain't gonna get away. Well, what makes you think that your word is good enough, Cartwright? It's good enough for me. I'm putting Jim Layton in Haas's custody until we find out about Amos Carter, one way or another. Good day, gentlemen. Thanks, Clem. You don't have to worry about me letting him get away, either. Well, I'm not worried about you, Haas. I just hope you're right about Jim Layton. Thanks again, Clem. When I was in town today, the doctor gave me this medicine for you, and you're going to take it. I don't want your medicine, and I don't want none of your dang protection. Anyhow, what give you the right to tell the sheriff that you'd be responsible for me? Jim, let me ask you something. How would you like it? Do you want to sit in a jail cell until they find Amos Carter? I don't have to sit in no jail cell. I don't have to stay here. Once I get to the mountains, why, there ain't nobody can find me. Now, you listen to me. If you leave here before this thing's settled, you'll be running like an animal the rest of your life. Well, there's a lot of people think of me as an animal anyhow, so what difference does it make? Oh, shut up and take this medicine. I told you I don't want to take none of that medicine. Look, Jim, when I told the doctor how you've been getting up out of bed and falling down, now he's afraid you're going to bust that wound open and get gangrene, and if you do, it'll kill you. Now, you're going to take this medicine whether you like it or not. Why don't you take it yourself? All right. You want it the hard way, you'll get it the hard way, baby. Why, you... You son of a gun. Get away from me, you big ox! Get out of here! You're gonna take this medicine? Oh, I have to stick it to you! God, I don't want any medicine! We can't medicine! I was just trying to get him to take his medicine, Paul. You better tell this big ox to leave me alone or I'm gonna pound him on top of the head till he ain't two feet tall in his high heel boots. Well, it's a good thing I built this house out of strong timber. Now, do you think you two could take it easy before you go through the floor into hop sing soup? You fellas sure live high on the hog around here. I don't know when I've ever had grub taste as good as that did tonight. Yeah, well, hop sing, you sure outdid yourself tonight. Thank you, Mr. Bent. Too bad I'm little Joe in here. Although, after watching you two eat, I guess there wouldn't have been anything left for them anyway. Well, I'll tell you something, Paul. It's a real pleasure to have somebody in the house that makes me feel dainty. <laughs> Sometimes it ain't no place you're being a big man, is it, Toss? You know, I've been a battling men all my life just because they wanted to knock me down a little bit. <laughs> you uh, sure picked a rough life for yourself. Jim? What made you decide to become a mountain man? Well, it wasn't exactly my own choosing. Uh -huh. After they tarred and feathered me and run me out of town, why, I figured that, well, maybe living in town wasn't for people like me. They tarred and feathered you? 
Yeah, you know how it is when you're a kid. They teach you to do good while you get your just reward. Well, I did good. I did real good. I went and crippled a feller for beating a horse, and, well, they tarred and feathered me and run me out of town. Guess that's when I learned that rewards for white people and half-breeds was two different things. Mm. Civilized white man. You know, the red man can be just as bad. I learned that when I went to live with my mother's folks, the Crows. After the Paiutes killed her in a raid, why, I found out that, well, I'd run out of places to go, so I just pulled up stakes and went to the mountains. You know, living alone in the mountains ain't a bad life. Well, no man can live alone, Jim, standing up against the world. Well, I can. Well, you don't have to, because we ain't the world, Jim. We're your friends. Now, don't you speak too fast, big fella. That cow says that I kill white men. Well, I have. When I lived with the crows, I killed more than my share of them fighting their battles. I come close to being lynched more than once. I've been in jail in three different states and two territories. As near as I can remember, I've killed at least three men in showdown fights. You know, being friends to a man like me ain't no easy proposition. I don't need your help. Like I told you, I can take care of myself. Till about noon, anyway, Adam. I better start riding that fence. Let me see it, Pa. Mm -hmm. How about you? You riding with it? I got that wagon wheel fixed over there on that freighter, Adam. Well, I have a lot of paperwork to do. Jim, you got something to keep you busy? Oh, I'll stick around with old Hoss here. Give him a little advice if he needs it. <laughs> well, he can sure use it. <laughs> Change the scenery do you good, too. I'll tell you what, little brother. Let's check out these crutches I made for you. Sure hope you built them strong enough to hold me up. Well, they, they was before you had breakfast. Should a rig like this cost a man? Oh, about two hundred dollars in Virginia City, with or without horses. Well, a strong team of horses would cost a man another four hundred, imagine. You mean tell me that it cost me uh, seven hundred dollars to drive out of Virginia City in an outfit like this? Yeah, maybe even more. The way prices are going up. Whew. You know. If you'd told me that you could shrink iron, I'd have had to call you a liar. Well, it's a good thing you didn't, little man, because if you had, you know what I'd have had to done? I'd have had to stuck your tongue right down on that hot iron. Just as soon as I get off these sticks, I reckon I'm going to have to show you who's the king of the mountain around here. Well, I'm going to be waiting, old fella. Don't you worry about that. Seven hundred dollars. Man, it's an awful lot of money for a feller to lay his hands on, especially if he has to do it honest. Yep, but it could cost you a whole lot more if you tried to do it otherwise. Hey, that's a mighty close friend. What did I tell you about being friends with me? thing in there an inch and a half. Yep, I'm a little rusty. Well, 
I think I'd rather take my chances at six year. After that puny breakfast we had this morning, I gathered some more that you old son. Oops. Hey. See you hit that. much good for skinning, would it? I don't use it for skinning. Got another knife for that. You know, prime beaver takes special handling. Kind of like you and this here wagon wheel. You figuring on going after more beaver when your leg gets well, Jim? Yep, if I can find me a big enough wagon and a stout enough team to pull it. You got to have a wagon and a team to trap beaver? No. Nope. But I'm sure going to need a rig if I catch up with them engines that went and stole that load from me and Mr. Carter. Yeah. You just remember one thing. I promised that sheriff that you'd stay here till he let you go. That's what you told me, little man. What do you want, Cal? Just came out to make sure he's still around. Easy, Jim. Easy. Easy. I'll carve a smile across his throat from ear to ear. He's the one who went and shot me in the leg. You're lucky it was only your leg. Because that way, you'll be able to still tell us where you hid them pelts. Won't you ask him, Paiutes? Look, Cal, now you've seen what you came to see. Why don't you just clear out? What are you so touchy about, Cartwright? You make a deal with him to split those pelts when he goes after them? You're asking to get hurt, Cal. If I wasn't hobbling around on these, why, I'd paint your head off. If I had it to do over again... I'd shoot both of your legs. Ah, ah, Jim! Jim! No, oh, Jim! Stop it, Jim! I tell you, he should have stayed in jail. Okay, it's an animal. Get out of here. Why'd you do that, you big ox? Because you'd have killed him, that's why. Sure I'd have killed him. I'm a finisher. Any man that fights Jim Layton knows that. Well, you better be glad you didn't finish off Cal Stacy. I told you once before that I can fight my own battles. Now help me up here. Well, I can see right now, Jim, that one of these days I'm just going to have to plain beat that honorness out of you. Yeah, and when you try it, remember what I said about being a finisher. <laughs> Mr. Cartwright. Good morning, Sheriff. Good morning, Clem. Good to see you. Thing. I was thinking of just uh, getting me some coffee. Join me? Yes, guess well. I get it. Come on, sit down. Thanks. Oh, to what do we owe the pleasure of this visit? Well, you uh, still got that Jim Layton here? Oh, yeah, yeah, just like Haas promised. He's here. Hobbling around with those crutches, he couldn't get very far anyway. What's on your mind? I got bad news for him. We found Amos Carter in the middle of nowhere and shot in the back. Hmm. Well, you figure, uh, you figure Jim shot him? I don't know, Ben. But it gives Cal Stacy just what he needs to get a warrant out for Layton's arrest. Matter of fact, both of them over at Judge Flanagan's office right now. Clem, how come you, uh, you didn't wait for that warrant before you came out here? Well, I thought maybe if he came in voluntarily, it might go better for him. It's real thoughtful of you. Boys went out working the range this morning. Jim went out in the wagon with him. Guess he got tired of looking at these four walls all the time. I'll, uh, I'll ride out and tell him you want to see him. All right. I hope you can get him to come in. Yeah. So do I. Strange man. Yeah. Ben, if he doesn't come in, you know I'll have to come out after him. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. Thank you.
thing. Me and old Hoss forgot our noonday meal. Uh, I come back after. Mr. Cartwright looking for you and Mr. Hoss. He goes south for range. You see him? No. Uh, that's where Adam and little Joe's are working. What do you want? Sheriff, he come. He say if they find Mr. Carter's body, why don't you go to town? Mr. Carter's dead, huh? You sure? Very sure. Shot him back. Is that right? Uh, oh, when you fix that grub by, maybe you better make enough for five. We run into some other fellas out there this morning. All right, fix five more. Good. Oh, uh, don't take too long, huh? You told Jim the sheriff was looking for him, didn't you? Yes, sir. And that you go look for him in South Pasture. Hobson do right? Yeah, you did right. Thank you, Mr. Ben. Thank you, Hobson. Thank you. Well. Looks like he's get out on it. Yep. Sure does. Maybe had reason to. Well, do you think he really killed Amos Carter? I don't know, Hoss. Killed a couple of other fellas by his own admission. Oh, but Paul, in a fair fight. Yeah, in a fair fight. Now, he knew that you'd given your word to keep him here. And still, he skedaddled. Hmm? Yeah. Mm. Well, I'm going to go after him, too. <laughs> if he went up to those mountains of his, you're not going to find him. He didn't go up the mountains. Now, how can you be so sure of that? Because he told me if he could ever lay hands on a wagon team, he's going after those Indians and those pelts, and that's where he is. Hoss, how can you be so sure that he didn't kill Carter? Well, first of all, Paul, he couldn't kill a man to steal. And secondly, Jim would never shoot a man in the back. Hoss, I know how you feel about him. But he's a dangerous man. Yep. But I gave my word, Paul, that he wouldn't get away. And I'm gonna go get him. He ain't big enough to stop me. You get Hop Singh to get me some grub together, I'm gonna go out and get a fresh pony. Jim? Howdy, big fella. You got enough grub there for an extra? Yeah, you never can tell when Prince is going to drop in. Pull up a chair. You already got here a couple of hours earlier, and you could have helped me load my pelts. Well, sir, if you'd have invited me back at the Ponderosa, I'd have been happy to. Help yourself. Looks like good stew. Want some coffee? No, thank you. What are you doing out here? Jim, how many times have you told me that 
the Indians stole these pelts. Well, they'd have done it, too, if I hadn't hit them first. What are you figuring on doing with them? I'm going to take them to Kansas City and sell them. Jim, I got no mind to use this, but I will if I have to. I had to get the drop on you because you're so blamed fast for that frog sticker. I told you once before, Hoss, don't you never start nothing with me unless you're a finisher. Well, why don't you try me out and find out whether or not I am? My bare hands against that gun? Against my bare hands. Now I know why you come up here all alone. You want to find out who's the king of the mountain. These pelts, Jim, they come first. You mean you want them for yourself? If I can whoop you, we'll take them back to the ranch and let my paw judge what to do with them. There ain't no way you can whoop me. All right. If you whip me, then you get on this wagon and you head east. And I'll claim I never caught up with you. Bargain? There ain't nothing that'll stop me short of murder. Now, hold on. Don't get in no rush. I don't hold with fighting on a full stomach. All right. First thing in the morning.
used to. You look like you've been in a fight, anyhow. You ought to see yourself, big feller. When well, you gonna head east, Jim? I ain't a heading east. You ain't? You earned the right. I wish I could, but I finally found a man that I couldn't whoop. You couldn't whoop? I just happened to come to before you, didn't I? Hoss, I ain't never gonna lie to you again. Jim. Did you kill Amos Carter? No, I never. But Cal Stacy and that lawyer is sure gonna try to make it stick it I did. Don't you worry. You'll get a fair trial, and, and you taking those pelts back in on your own, that's gonna help. I don't believe that, Hoss, but you're the king of the mountain. Let's go. Well, that does it. Let's go. Jim. I've been doing a little thinking. You sure do things the hard way. Yeah. Now, Amos Carter was killed. Shot in the back, mind you. Now, you didn't kill him. And you say you chased the Indians off uh, an hour or so after he left. What are you driving at, anyhow? Just this. If you didn't kill him, and the Indians didn't kill him, then who did kill him? Well, maybe somebody that stood to make some money out of him being dead. That's exactly right. Like Cal Stacy. Hey, you've got muscles in your head. It don't take muscles to figure that Cal Stacy would be the only man to benefit from his death and yours, and that's how come he's been accusing you so. Hey, maybe we better have a little talk with that gentleman, huh? Senses got right. Brought him back. Huh? Must have been quite a battle doing it. No, no, no battle. As a matter of fact, when we learned who killed Amos Carter, why old Jim came in as peaceful as a dove. Well, we know who killed Carter. Get over to the sheriff and tell him that Layton is here. Why, Cal, now you know dead gum good and well. The sheriff's out there scouring the whole countryside for us now. But he's looking the wrong place, ain't he? I'll tell you what, Mr. Nelson, you go on over there and you wait for the sheriff. And when you see him, you tell him that me and Jim's got Mr. Carter's killer all plucked, dressed, and cleaned. You heard him? Yeah. Oh, no, 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 he won't. Matter of fact, that's why Jim and me came into town. We want to talk to you, Cal, kind of private-like. Why don't we move over here to this other table? Wait, 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 You know, Jim, I saw a funny thing one time. I saw a couple of cowboys get into a scrape. And you know what they done? One of them took his booty, you just like this. And he came down just like this on that feller's instep. <laughs> Boom! He crippled that poor feller, so he hobbled around the rest of his natural life. <laughs> you don't need this no more. You know, Hoss... It's real interesting what a fella can learn just from watching other people. It's like uh, you watching that cowboy with the busted foot. I lived with the crows for quite a while, and they taught me all about scouting. 
Ain't never had a chance to use that lesson yet. Tell you what, Jim. Wouldn't be fair for me and you to tear up old Bill's saloon here with Cal, so I'll cut the cards with you to see who takes him outside. Nah, you take him, hoss. I got a terrible temper, and, well, just be our luck winding up with nobody to try for Mr. Carter's murder. But, Jim, Cal here accused you. I think it'd be fair if you took him. No, all right, go on, cut him. Fair and square. Well, you go ahead and take him, Jim, and I'll just hang around here and wait for you. This ain't gonna take too long. Come on, partner. Wait a minute. What are you gonna do? Now, Cal, if you don't know that by now, me and old Jim sure have wasted a lot of talent. Sure enough. Ain't you got to something you'd like to tell us? It was self-defense. We quailed over the pelts and I shot him, but it was self-defense. He was shot in the back. Your lawyer sure is gonna have a dandy time. Well, Jamie's yours, why don't you take it? ain't much good at words right now. Well, there ain't a whole lot of people that I'd say this to, but you know, Hoss, you're a real man. Almost my equal. Almost your equal? Why, you big overgrown little right, good you, for you two. Well, look, haven't you two had enough of this? Just because this outsized son of yours thinks he whooped me in a little old fight. Little old fight? I'll be nursing these bruises for six months from that little old fight. Well, when you get your health back, why don't you come on up to my mountains? You know, this here low altitude sure has been bad for my wind. Jim, you have yourself a good trip back, and uh, stay out of the way of them pirates here. Thanks a lot, Mr. Cartwright. Oh, say goodbye to Adam and little Joe for me, will you? I sure will. Uh, by the way, uh, when the sheriff gives you my money, why, just take out the price of my horse and outfit. No, oh, never mind about that. I'm going to charge that to his account. <laughs> 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 Jim, so long. You know, Hoss, even from up here, you're a big man. <laughs> Are you no good for nothing? <laughs> I've been wanting to do that myself. <laughs> Big cat. Big cat up by the herd. Hey, boy, what happened? Joe's horse stumbled. Get to town and get the doctor, quick. Oh, he's a big one, Pop. He's the biggest one I've ever seen. He's gonna raise Cain with those cattle up there. Oh, don't worry about that now. Is Coachie's all right? Yeah. Yeah, she's all right. Luckier than you. Gee, I don't even know what it was. I didn't see a thing. Must have been a chuck hole or something. When I saw you fall, Joe, for a moment, it was just like your mother. The same way that afternoon, she came riding up to the house. There's so much of her in you, Joe. So much.
Fine instrument, eh, monsieur? 35 inches of authority. Yes, sir. Excuse me, sir. Are you Marius Angeville? A bit worn in the tooth, a little bit sour in the stomach, but the very same. Well, I'm glad I found you, sir. My name is Ben Cartwright. Should I know you? Oh, no, sir, no. I, I've just arrived in New Orleans. I, I have a ranch up in Nevada. Oh, you've come along with us, sir. Yes, sir. Around the Cape. By a ship. By Clipper. A fine voyage. Yes, sir. Ah, how I miss that. Sir, there was a man worked on my ranch. He was from New Orleans. Name of Jean de Marigny. Jean? It's been so long. Is he well? Happy? No, sir. He's dead. Jean? He was like my own son. His last thoughts were of you and his wife. I promised I'd see you both. And, of course, his mother. <laughs> his mother. Forgive me. But there are some things... Sorry to have to bring you such bad news, Madame de Marigny. I hope that it might bring you, you some consolation to know of your son's courage. I'm growing old, monsieur, and quite dry of tears. The de Marignys carry a proud but bitter heritage. We cried at the death of the Emperor. We cried in the streets of New Orleans when the French flag came down. And I cried when my son ran away from his disgrace. His disgrace, madame? You knew little about him. Well, only that he had separated from his wife, whom he loved very dearly. Love is often a crown of thorns. Yes, yes, I suppose that's true. I... I hope to see his wife, Marie. I do not wish to discuss her, monsieur. Well, madame, she is your son's wife. Marie Delval was never meant to be the wife of a de Marigny. Forgive me, monsieur, but that is not your concern. If I can be of service while you are in New Orleans... Oh, thank you, madame. I, there, there is one thing. Oui? I brought a shipment of raw furs with me from Nevada. I was hoping I might dispose of them while I'm here. But I have little connection with my husband's business, monsieur. Well, Jean suggested that I contact your late husband's partner. He might arrange to sell my furs for me in the Parisian market. I shall be happy to introduce you to Monsieur Clermont. Thank you. I will arrange for a meeting and notify you. Excellent. Where are you staying? Well, with a friend. Uh, Marius Angerville in the Passage de la Bourse. You know Marius Angerville? Well, yes, he's, he's a friend of your son's. Uh... That one is no friend to my son. Bonjour, monsieur. Thank you, madame. Good day. Jean's mother wasn't too friendly toward me. She isn't exactly fond of her daughter-in-law, is she? She isn't, never was. I'm afraid Marie isn't very fond of me. We may not receive a warm reception, my boy. I haven't seen her since the day Jean left New Orleans. Jean told me that you were very good friends. Mm -hmm. We were, until I challenged her beloved cousin, Edouard Darcy, to a duel. She's never forgiven me for wanting to kill him, which I was most anxious to do. So it's 
instead I presented the monsieur with a keg of Barbados rum. Oh, monsieur de Fau was chagrined. I couldn't imagine why. After all, what did he expect? <laughs> At any rate, he had a nervous breakdown and hasn't returned to the club since. <laughs> oh, marvelous! Marie, tell us about the time you rode into the Salle d'Orléans in the middle of a ball. Uh, no, André, I, I have no more time for tales. Marius Angeville, I thought by now the devil had claimed it for his own. I'm afraid both you and he will have to wait a trifle longer. I brought a friend to meet you, fresh from the wilderness, Marie. May I present Monsieur Cartwright from Virginia City, Nevada, madame? I've heard there is such a place. Yes, ma'am, I'm afraid there is. Full of wild animals and much wilder people. Now, if you'll forgive me, I'm going to the bar. Madame, may I speak with you in private? Monsieur, is that a Western custom, demanding a lady's attention on such short acquaintance? What I have to say is rather serious. Serious? Why, no one is serious here. People come here for pleasure. What I have to say, it's about your husband. Harry, I thought you were going to join us. A little cognac, René, please. It seems the game-legged old Hotspur himself has decided to distinguish us with a visit. Why not, Darcy? We will squat in hell together, you and I. If you're in a hurry to get there, Hotspur, I'm always available to assist you on your way. Next time, the boot may be on the other foot. I am pleased to have met you, monsieur. Marie, please hurry. Monsieur, I do not wish to discuss my husband. I, I think you had better leave. Is your husband of no interest to you? Of uh, no interest whatsoever. I'm afraid there's something that you don't uh, there know. There is nothing I wish to know about Jean. Bonjour, monsieur. Monsieur. My name is Darcy. I'm the proprietor here. How do you do, sir? Are you a friend of Marius? Yes, in a way. You don't seem to be attracted to our little sport. <laughs> Most Americans find it very stimulating. I didn't come here to gamble. I'm afraid I'm not exactly attracted to blind chance. <laughs> Perhaps you're attracted more by aesthetic things? And if I am? Oh, that would surprise me. You lack a certain polish in your technique. I guess my polish has been dulled by hard work, monsieur. Good night. I fought amid the grape shot and bullets of Waterloo. A saber in my hand, with valiant men, honorable men. You've had too much to drink, Marius. Don't tell me what I've had. In vino veritas, in wine, there is truth. Let me help you. What is it? An old wound. This afternoon, it became as fresh as the day I received it. Defending the honor of an old friend. Ah, oh, Jean, Jean, you came to me, but I failed you. We all failed you.
What does that mean? You all failed him. Well, he'd just been married. He adored his young and beautiful wife. But when he believed her unfaithful, he ran. His whole world shattered. Mm -hmm. Now I'm beginning to understand why Madame de Marigny didn't want to talk about her. I never believed the stories spread about Marie. I tried to prove them false. She was the innocent victim of deceit. What was the truth? The real facts about what happened are locked in her heart. Along with grief and disillusionment. You again. I'm a stubborn man, madame. Please go away. I will, as soon as you've given me a chance to talk to you. I know all I need to know about Jean. Do you know that he's dead? I'm sorry. That's what I've been trying to tell you. He made me promise to seek you out and let you know. Sorry, I had to give it the news so bluntly, but you left me little choice. Go on, monsieur. Jean died after saving my life. He was a brave and courageous man. I accept your statement, monsieur, but it does not fit the Jean de Marigny I knew. He asked me to tell you that he loved you. Love. He didn't know what it meant to love. A man on his deathbed doesn't lie. All right, you've told me. Now, good day, monsieur. Well, that isn't all he asked me to say to you. I'm not interested. He asked me to say that he forgave you. Forgave me? As his words were, he loved you and he forgave you. For what? He believed a horrible lie. It was absurd. He couldn't have accepted it and really loved me. Instead of trusting me, he ran off, leaving me disgraced and humiliated. Where was he when I needed him? When my baby needed him? I didn't know there was a child. There is no child. His mother took him from me at birth. He died of the fever. Jean never told me about that. Did he know? If he knew... Would he have cared? Leave me alone, monsieur, please. Well, you have speed and accuracy, but your long lunge and cart left you open to my repost. You're too anxious for the kill. I'm an impatient woman, Marius. That could be the death of you. Another bout, three, three touches. I'm tired. You didn't come here for a fencing lesson, Marie. Not after all this time. I'm not sure why I came. I'm not sure of anything anymore. Well, I can't give you any fatherly advice. There are no words to prevent memories from coming back to haunt you. You remind me of a, a gaunt old tree, gnarled and sad, all covered with Spanish moss and standing up to your knees in dark water. 
You've been a loyal friend, Marius. Even though you... You were wrong about my cousin, Edouard. He's been very good to me. I... I... I think I wanted to tell you I'm sorry. Oh, please don't run off on my account. I'll be out of your way. Marius told me you wouldn't be here today. I came back sooner than I planned. I was out walking around your magnificent city. I I'm sorry if I've been rude, but you just don't understand. Allow me. New Orleans is a strange city, strange and unpredictable. There's none other like it in the world. I find the people rather difficult to understand, too. They're a blend of so many things. Yes. Good and evil. Bitterness and sorcery and virtue. You could live a lifetime and find nothing worse than warm sunshine or bubbles and honey. Or you might suddenly become aware of the most, the most terrible rottenness. The West is like that, too. Out west there are trees that, that touch the blue of the sky. Unimaginably beautiful. And yet there's an anger and violence about nature that seems to be there just to test people. But it hardens them too, makes them strong and unfeeling. It's a man's country. Are you going back soon? Yes. I thought maybe before I go, maybe we could have supper together. And I promise not to talk about anything more personal than bubbles and honey. I'm sorry. Good day, monsieur. Bonjour, Marius. She's like a woman possessed. One moment gay and full of life, the next driven running to escape from something that seems to chase her. Well, she loses herself in her way, and I in mine. It'll learn to recover from sorrow. I did from mine. Did you? <laughs> I think not. You're still nursing your wounds, just like me. I learned to forget, Marius. Marie can't forget. A husband who deserted her, a mother-in-law who loathed her, they had to be married secretly to avoid her interference. What about this, uh, this other man, the one who was supposed to? Well, I never found out who he was. One of Darcy's friends, perhaps. I tried to make Jean see the truth. But it was no use. Well, it isn't my affair. I have my own responsibilities. Jean saved your life. He gave you this responsibility. Just a minute, Marius. I paid my debt to Jean. How? By bringing us the sad tale of his death? By bargaining with his mother to sell your furs? Those furs represent a year's work. I need the money to expand my ranch. Besides, what the devil could I do here that you have not been able to do? You could help me find the other man. Oh, that happened years ago. Wouldn't help Jean now anyway. It's a dead issue. Not to me! And Marie isn't a dead issue either. You could talk to her. Make her see that Darcy isn't what she thinks. That he isn't trying to help her. That he wants only to fulfill his own ambitions by marrying her off to some fat aristocrat. Well, what makes you think she'd listen to me? Anyway, I'm not going to get involved. I have two sons. I'm going to get back to them. Well, maybe you're right, my boy. Why bother with other people's agonies when you have your own to keep you company? I do not compromise with situations, Madame de Marigny. Then you are aware that this man is a threat, such as Angerville never was. I can see the possibility. I'm not overly disturbed by it. He's young, aggressive, and he feels a debt of gratitude to my son. 
all very subversive attributes. I view this matter of the Americans' intrusion with utmost gravity. There is no cause for alarm, madame. The man I persuaded to be attentive to your son's wife is now residing on the island of Haiti. He could come back. The American could get the truth out of him. And if he searches hard enough, he could discover from various sources that Marie's child is not dead. That could lead to the most undesirable results. I want him to leave New Orleans. I have arranged for his furs to be bought so that he will have no excuse to stay. But just in case he is stubborn, I want him out of here. Do you understand? I understand perfectly, madame. If you can afford the expense, I can afford the inconvenience. Madame. brought up in the convent after my parents died. It's a beautiful place. I was happy here. I was something of a rebel. Yes, I think I can imagine you as a rebel. I used to climb that tree and look over the wall, fascinated by the beautiful French ladies in their Paris gowns, with shining black hair and skin like roses. I couldn't wait to wash my face in sour buttermilk. <laughs> when I was a boy, I used to stand on a pier and watch the great clipper ships putting out to sea. I used to imagine myself a captain on a quarterdeck, scanning the horizon, looking for rich new lands to discover. For a long time, I had to content myself with finding my heroes in books. I think that was far better than if they disillusioned you, you... You can throw them into the fire. It's getting late. May I, uh, may I walk you home? Who are your heroes, Marie? Don John of Austria, Henri of Navarre, Cardinal Richelieu. Bold, forceful men. Perfect heroes for a young Creole girl who hadn't the vaguest ideas about love and life. You seem to have some definite ideas now. About life? We don't live. We're only in the expectation of living. And love? To love is to place one's happiness in someone else's hands. I see so much of my own loneliness in you. Marie. I know I have no right to ask. What happened that night? I, I was alone. John had finally worked up the courage to, to tell his mother we'd been married. But he wanted to do it by himself. I must have been sleeping for some time when I... I became aware of someone near me. I thought it was Jean. When I realized it wasn't, I struggled. That's when Jean came in the room. It must have been terrible for you. He should have believed me. Yes, he should have. His mother was anxious to believe the lie. Something should have been done about that lie. A long time ago, Marie. Ah, monsieur. 
How popular you are becoming, cousin. That Marius and his American friend are becoming regular customers. That's Monsieur Clermont with his back to us at the table. Um, wait for me at the bar. Leave Marius alone, Edouard. Uh, don't concern yourself. My quarrel with the old Hotspur is ancient history. Mr. Clermont, I'm Ben Cartwright. Oh, it is a pleasure to meet you, monsieur. I got your note and came as quickly as I could. Oh, yes, yes, uh, about the furs. Madame de Marigny spoke to me. Uh, you play poker, monsieur Cartwright? Well, I, I thought you wanted to discuss business, sir. Oh, certainly, my boy, certainly. Uh, I have a moment of that reserved for our negotiation. Uh, won't you join us for a little while, and we'll discuss business later. Please do join us, monsieur. Thank you. I have one vice. Cards. Well, gentlemen, I have three queens. Ah, oh, Monsieur Darcy, have you had the pleasure of meeting Monsieur Cartwright? Yes. He's the gentleman who does not devote himself to blind chance. He's certainly doing well with it tonight. Throw a lucky man into the Nile, says an old Arabian proverb, and he'll come up with a fish in his mouth. <laughs> Monsieur Clermont, I hope my luck will improve tomorrow. Monsieur, enchanté. Thank you. May I join in? Please do. I believe you, Monsieur Cartwright. I'll pay for the pleasure of seeing your hand, Monsieur Cartwright. Incredible luck. It's your deal. Marius. Won't you join me? Thank you. Monsieur Cartwright, may I see those cards? cheat and a thief. Darcy, you cut those cards. Barbarian. You accuse me of... Are you uncouth backwoods? I demand a satisfaction for this insult, monsieur. The plantation allowed at dawn. Weapons, rapiers. Bon nuit. He can't fence Darcy, and you know it. If he doesn't wish to satisfy me, he better conduct himself out of town immediately. You won't need to do either. Maurice, you stay out of this. I'm already in it. This is my affair. Now stop interfering. You can have him when I'm through with him. How popular I am. Gentlemen, it'll be a pleasure to do business with both of you. Whoever is first is immaterial. We let the cards decide. Now, Marius, listen to me. Edward, no, please. Marie, you stay out of this. Marius, will you please let the cards? Be ridiculous. All right, I'll cut them for you. 
Yours, queen. Mine, king. You lose, my boy. All right, Darcy. The oak grove, a large plantation at dawn. Perfectly satisfactory. Now, Marius, I'm Come along, my boy. Marius, will you? Come along! Edward, no, please. Monsieur Cartwright is no match for your rapier. He knows nothing of such things. And Marius is an old man. He's crippled. Why are you so concerned about Mr. Cartwright? Oh, come on, Marius. I was tricked into that duel, you. Of course you were. Why? Obviously, you're considered a threat. A threat? To what? To whom? By whom? Obviously, again, by Madame de Marigny, which is why she's hired Darcy to arrange your convenient demise. Well, it's still my fight, and I won't have you interfere. My dear boy, do you actually believe you could meet Darcy in a cartel with rapiers? The man's a professional duelist. He's killed four men. He half crippled me, a fencing master. Well, then we'll have to find some other way to settle it, that's all. There is no other way. Unless I kill the man first, he'll kill you. Marius, I'm not helpless. I may not be a fencer, but I can hold my own with the best of them, with my fists or with practically any kind of firearm. It's too late for that. He's maneuvered you, so he has the choice of weapons. You'd better understand me, Marius. I'm not leaving town, and I'm not going to let you do my fighting for me. And there's something you must understand. I have been given another chance, and you're not taking it from me. You have everything. A great future. Sons. For me, there is only honor. Without it, I'm nothing. Honor. The word hangs in the air of New Orleans like the refrain of a song. I taught you the art of fencing, Marie. I taught you the code that holds men to the high standard of honor and courtesy. The code. Marius, this time you will die. I know it. Perhaps, but with dignity. Then, Marius is just trying to save you. He can't win. He's not going to have a chance to try. Ben! I've heard all I want to hear, Marius. The discussion is over. Well, maybe you're right, my boy. Maybe it's just the stubborn pride of an old man. What about you? How are you going to fight, Darcy? I thought your concern was for Marius. I love the dear man. But... But what? My concern isn't only for Marius. I just saw Marius and Darcy headed for the Oaks. Fool. You'll have to show me where they hold those stupid duels. My carriage is outside. No one. Continue.
Marius. Marius, you old fool. I failed you, my boy. I failed you both. You know what you are, Darcy? A hired assassin fighting an old man. You're a white-livered, cowardly disgrace to yourself and your so-called coat of honor. I consider that a challenge which supersedes our previous arrangement. My choice of weapon is pistols, here and now. Agreeable, monsieur. Andre, the pistols. That's fire, monsieur. You'll live, Darcy. If you tell the truth about Marie and the man you hired to disgrace her. You know nothing of the matter of honor. Fire and be done with it! Honor. What do you know about honor? about Marie. Tell him! Yes, yes. Madame de Marigny arranged the whole thing through me. as he wanted to, according to the code by which he lived. The code? I'm sick to death of the code! Of all this stupid, shallow desperation that drives decent men to destroy themselves. Look at this hanging moss with its slime and sickness. 
Like this proud society that builds a wall around itself and shuts out the world. Marie, there's a world beyond that wall. The real world. A beautiful world. Where trees touch the sky. Yes, where trees touch the sky and they grow straight and tall and clean. Where life is reborn every moment, every day. Not for me. Death follows me. Only in the past. Only in the past. There's life ahead for you. For us. Without you, it would be empty for me. Empty? But with your sons, the future you're building for them? Until I came here, I thought my life was quite full. My sons were all I needed. But now I know, without you, it could never be complete. Come back with me. Be my wife. I love you. Ben, I love you. A little time we had together, your mother and I, here in the Ponderosa. From the time we were married, until the time you were born. Until that day she came riding up to the house and fell. Doctor's on his way, Paul. Well, brother, I thought you was half dead. Are you all right? Yeah, sure, I'm all right. Take more than that fool horse to get rid of me. Why does this always happen at the beginning of haying season? Just plain lucky, I guess. Just plain lucky. City because of this advertisement. Go ahead, read it, Mr. Cartwright. You just read it. <clears throat> Wanted elementary school teacher. Apply Virginia City. Ben Cartwright, school chairman. Not one word about male or female, is there? Oh, no, no ma'am, there isn't. Oh, you think it's funny? Coming all this way just to have some man down at the school building tell me that no women need apply. <laughs> Why, my little boy and I sacrificed every penny. Suffered great hardship and danger just in order to get here. I'm, I'm sure my pa will make it up to you, ma'am. Your pa? Hmm? Oh, yeah, that, uh... See, that's the Ben Cartwright, the school commissioner. That's... No, that's, that's pa. That's Ben. I'm Joe. I'm just one of the sons. Well, very well, then. You may, uh, you may bring your father here to me. <laughs> oh, I wish I could bring him here, ma'am. But uh, he's in town right now with my two brothers. But he'll be back. Why don't you, uh, why don't you go inside and wait and have dinner with him? No, no, thank you very much. I'm afraid we can't spare the time. We must uh, get back to town. That's an awful long ride back to town. Besides, a boy here looks like he's got a hole in his stomach. I do. I'm hungry. Tommy, how can you say that? Well, maybe it's because it's true. Now, look, why don't you stay for dinner? I'm sure if you talk to my pa, he'll straighten everything out. Sure, we'd love to. Well, all right. Oh. 
Why don't you take care of your mother? I'll put your horse away. Okay. Bye. See? You didn't have to do it. It was just a waste of time. Oh, no, Tommy. I don't think I wasted my time. Not at all. such handsome men and such hospitality. How could a lady not forgive you, Mr. Cartwright? Well, I'll, I'll try not to take advantage of that when we discuss some suitable arrangement for that terrible oversight in the advertisement. Why, thank you, sir. Well. <laughs> I'm afraid I'm a little bit bigger than he is. <laughs> you got him cleaned all over. What magic do you have? No magic. It was easy. Just scrubbed him. Huh? Well, I don't want to take all the credit. Hop Singh held him. And Hop Singh just take a bath yesterday. Here's some cookie for you because you eat your dinner so good. Man, I'll take two baths tomorrow. Oh, now, Tommy, dear, please don't start making any plans. We're leaving in the morning. All right, Mom. Oh, why so soon? Well, I'm afraid I couldn't convince your father that I should get that job. Well, Mrs. Grant, it was the, the school board's decision that they wanted a, a male teacher. I think Mrs. Grant understands that part, just that it's, well, it's kind of a long trip back to Carson City. Might be a good idea if you just stay here for a while, just for rest. Oh, no. Why, why that would be imposing. I, I, I couldn't think of that. Oh, well, you didn't think of it. I did. Well, of course, you're more than welcome, Mrs. Grant. Well, I, uh, I have made other plans. Oh, why can't you change your plans? Well, just for a little while. I think Tommy's counting on it. Well, all right, then, for two days. Good. Tomorrow morning, I'll take you for a ride, and you'll see some of the most beautiful country in the world. Oh, I'd like that, if it won't take you away from your work. Ah, uh, but you see, that is his work. While the rest of us ride the range and tend the stock on the Ponderosa, he is in charge of the scenery. It's not that I'm biased, uh, Mrs. Grant, which, of course, I am. But I do think that a trip around the Ponderosa will be much more pleasant than teaching school in Virginia City. Oh, I'm positive of that, Mr. Cartwright. Uh, not that teaching children isn't pleasant, too. <laughs> oh, really? The other teachers seem to regard it as a kind of war. You know, the kids fighting to go fishing and hunting, and the teachers fighting to keep their minds on Mr. McGuffey. Well, he is important, you know, but... Well, there's no beauty in it. No culture. Not like in the classics. Did you say... the classics? Precisely, Mr. Cartwright. Marlowe, Johnson, and, of course, the immortal bard himself, Mr. William Shakespeare. Well, very inspiring, of course. I, I don't know if the children would understand reading Shakespeare. Reading? No, Mr. Cartwright. Now, you see, I speak it to them, enact it. The spoken word is far more exciting than the printed one. She's an actress. Oh, you uh, are an actress, too? Well, you see, we, we of the theater, well, there's an off-season, and sometimes we find it necessary to take other jobs. Of course, back east, people understand and accept this. But out here, well, people are a bit ignorant of the theater, and they seem to think that an actress is a saloon girl. Oh, well, I don't think everybody feels that way. Uh, what he means is that uh, Virginia City boasts one of the greatest opera houses this side of Chicago. As a matter of fact, the touring companies play to capacity crowds here. Oh, how wonderful to hear that. Well, we who tour back east didn't realize how civilized it was beginning to get out here. Yes, it's a common mistake, Mrs. Grant. Well, I'll see what I can do to change it. A few letters from me to such illustrious artists as Madame Siddons and Fanny Kimball might bring them out here, too. Oh, you've played with Madame Siddons and Kimball? Oh, yes. 
The Wayward Girl, Now in Spring. Magnificent productions. Didn't Edwin Booth tour in those? Oh, Edwin Booth. Such a great actor. Yes, and a great man. Oh, uh, you, you've met him? Yes, I've known him since college. Uh... Ma, I'd like to go to bed now. Oh, of course, my love. You must be sleepy. Look, you go on up to bed, and I'll be up to kiss you very soon. Okay. Come on, Tommy, I'll carry you up, all right? There you go. Now, it's going to be a ride on a real bucking bronc. Ready? Hey, Rio, hold on. I don't... Ma! Don't talk too long. Good night. Here we go. Hold on. Hold on, Rio. Tommy's really taken with Joe. Well, I suppose that's because Joe is not much more than a youngster himself. Youngster? Well, he's just turned 22. Oh, yes, well, that is young, isn't it? Well, I was just out checking Miss Grant's horse. He's, no, he's going to need to be shot all the way around. Well, there's no hurry about that. Mrs. Grant is going to be staying on for a few days. Hey, that young son of yours is going to be mighty happy about that. Dinner ready pretty soon. Good. Got to go wash up. See you in a minute. Hey, get up there in a bed. There you go. Let's get under these covers. Get nice and warm. She don't mean no harm, Joe Parnes. And no harm about what, huh? For saying she's an actress. Oh. Before Pa died, he used to take care of us real good. Your mom's real serious about being an actress, isn't she? I don't know. But she don't know all those people like she says. She just talks that way. Don't be mad at her. Uh, Tommy, the last thing I'd ever be is mad at your ma. Does your ma take care of you just on what she makes teaching school? A school teacher? Oh, no. I'm never supposed to tell how she earns her money. Well, in that case, you better not. But I want to. She... She sings in a saloon. Ma says it ain't culture. Ain't something actors they should do. Well, I don't know. It sure is nothing to be ashamed of. There's nothing wrong with singing in saloons. You know, my sing's real good, Joe. Honest. Yeah, I bet she does, Tommy. And you better get some good sleep, or you'll be too tired for that picnic tomorrow. All right. Good night. Good night. Just as the sun was rising, you might have heard me singing in the valley below. Oh, don't deceive me. Oh, never leave me. How could you use a poor maiden so? Remember the flowers that you brought to me day. Remember the vows that you made to be true. Oh, don't deceive me. Oh, never leave me. How could you use a poor maiden so? Oh, promise you'll cherish me and cling to me dearly. Promise you'll marry me and save me from the grave. Oh, don't deceive me. Oh, never leave me. How could you use a poor maiden so? I've got to clean up this mess. Come on, what's the matter? Would you please get Tommy? We've got to go back to the house and pack. I mean, we're leaving for San Francisco in the morning. Look, I'm not going to go anywhere. You tell me what's the matter. You're frightened, aren't you? Frightened? Now, what would I be frightened of? Of what just happened. Oh, that, Joe. Well, you're just a boy. Oh. 
Oh, so that's it. Yeah, well, how old are you, Grandma? I am 27, and you have just turned 22. Hmm. Well, that meant a lot when you were five and I was one, but it doesn't mean much now, does it? Oh, let's forget it, Joe. Look, the age different isn't important, although no woman wants no to... No woman wants to what? Fall in love with a man that's younger than herself? Look, it's not that. It's just that there's something that I've got to do. Tell me what it is. Well, it's a very long story, I'm afraid. I'm a good listener. Try me. All right. I don't know where to begin. Well, I guess it all started when Frank died. That was my husband. I had to earn a living, and... Well, jobs weren't easy to come by for women. But there was this... This actress named Millicent Hubbard, I remember. She was playing with her traveling troupe in Omaha. And I got a job as a company seamstress, personal maid to Miss Hubbard, and bit player, all for $12 a week. That wasn't very much, but it was enough for us to keep from starving. But more important than that, it... I don't know, there was this... this feeling... When I went out on that stage, even with that tiny little part, I... Just knowing that, that all of those hundreds of people out there in the darkness... Watching me. Hanging on every word, I'd say. Watching every move. It was like... Oh, you're gonna laugh, but... I felt I was the most important human being in the whole world. I expected you to laugh. I wouldn't laugh at anything you said. So I think it's it's good. I think it's important that, that somebody has something like that that they believe so strongly about. It makes life worthwhile. You know, Joe, I... I didn't really want that teaching job. I don't want to teach. I don't want to do anything except act. And boy, I'd do anything for that. I just wanted to make your father feel guilty so that he'd be forced to pay me a few dollars and we'd maybe get a few free meals besides. You see, that's the way I am. I'll lie, I'll cheat, I'll maybe even steal. I don't know. But I do know that I don't want to hurt you. And I might if I stay here. If you leave, you'll hurt me more. I'll go get Tommy. Hey, little buddy. You can't have seconds until you eat your first. I just ain't hungry, I guess. Seeing as how we're leaving early tomorrow, I better go to bed. You taking me up, Joe? No, darling. Joe isn't finished with his dinner yet. I'll, uh, I'll put you to bed. Come on. Hey, Tommy, I'll be up in a minute to tuck you in, all right? Night. Mrs. Grant. Um. Oh, you go on up, dear. I'll be right there. I've been thinking about that advertisement I placed. And the long trip you made and all for nothing. Well, I was wondering if perhaps a month's salary wouldn't be a fair settlement. Oh, no, Mr. Cartwright, you don't owe me anything. Well, that was all a, a silly mistake. Well, it, it would make me feel better. And, well, with the prices being so sky high in San Francisco, I, I think every little bit would help, don't you? Oh, please, please don't worry. Why, the empresarios are casting all their touring companies now. Why, I bet that with inside a week, I'll have a big part in an important production. She's going to depend on her acting ability to feed herself and that boy. I see two hungry people. Well, why don't you keep your opinions to yourself? I don't know why you think you're a critic. I'm sorry, Joe. No offense. But, you know, you could be doing a very nice thing if you would 
talk her out of trying to make a career for herself as an actress. Right to sleep, Tommy. We've got a big day ahead of us tomorrow. Oh, you're gonna love San Francisco. So many things to do and, and places to see. What's wrong, Marie? Well, now, you mustn't worry about that, darling. Mommy will get a big part this time. I just know it. And, and you've got to believe that, too. Mm-hmm. You, you know, it's different in San Francisco. It's not as crowded. They need actresses. Sure. I'm kind of sleepy. Of course you are, darling. Good night. Good, Good night, night, sweetheart. important. Let me in, huh? Come in, Joe. Listening to you sing today gave me an idea. Would you like to earn a few hundred dollars before you left? What do you mean? Well, you know I don't want you to leave, and you can use the money, so I figured out a way to help both of us. Oh, and what way is that? I have a friend named Jim Larkin who's always in the market for a good singer. Singer? For what? Where? Just the finest club in Virginia City. Uh-huh. You mean a saloon? How dare you suggest such a thing? Julia, no saloon pays a singer $50 a week. $50? $50. I told you it was no saloon. Well, that would make it uh, easier. I mean, in, in case rehearsals don't start right away in San Francisco. Of course it would. Now you're talking. Oh, there I go again. Joe, I, I've sung in saloons lots of times. Oh, yeah? Well, this will make it all easier, then. Besides, I bring my whole family opening night. Spread the word. She's good tonight if she was at those tryouts. This place will be packed like this every night. Well, don't you worry about it, Jim. You won't be disappointed. <laughs> I'll try not to. Where's your brothers? Boss? Adam? Jim, hi. Sit down. Take a chair. I'm going to wait for you. Hey, How's it going, Jim? Hey, three bears. Three bears. Hey, where's Pop? Oh, Tommy, rail him into a game of checkers, and guess what? He's already beat Paul three out of five. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like we're going to have some fun here tonight. Yeah. Friends! Friends! When you got a beautiful girl who can sing like a bird, well, like the man says, you don't talk about it. You just, uh, you bring her on. I'd like to have him meet... Miss Julia Grant. I, uh, I'd like to sing a lullaby my mother taught me. When you look around, young gals, and there's no one left to marry, and you wish you hadn't wasted time on Tom and Dick and Harry, Oh, don't lose hope. The country's full of men who'll end your fears. The kind who love to stay out nights and watch a herd of steers. <laughs> They're waiting there for you out where the skies are blue. Go west, young gal, go west.
wonderful, baby. Absolutely wonderful. How about letting us buy you a little drink? Oh, no, thank you. I'm afraid I could. Oh, come on. The boys are all hankering to meet up with you. No, no. Why, you're the prettiest thing that's hit this town in the coon's age. Well, I... Hear what the lady said. What's Joe. that? Just keep your hands off her. Joe, I'm just trying to buy her a little drink. Well, you're not going to buy her a drink, and neither is anybody else. Oh, come on, Joe. Got you outnumbered. Joe! Seems though the family honor is at stake. Oh. Hey. I ain't never been in a fight without my hat. fight last night? There wasn't no quilling, Beepo. What kind of a brawl were you three in? That was the uh, opening performance of his friend. It was that Chuck Miller, though, Pa. With us. So he got out of line, and all we tried to do is... Oh. You ought to be ashamed of yourselves, all three of you, particularly you, Joe. Did they tell you what they did last night, Mr. Cartwright? Well, so far, they've just sent up some smoke signals. I've never been so humiliated in my life. Oh, well, there you are. Well, my place is a shambles. I've been up... Excuse me. Been up all night trying to glue it back together again. Do you know how much damage you did in there last night, little Joe? Huh? $150 worth, at least, and you're going to pay for it. You're going to pay every red cent of it. Yeah, well, why doesn't Chuck Miller pay part of it? Well, why should he? All he did was offer to buy the young lady a drink. If she's going to work in saloons, she's got to get used to that. As soon as I find out exactly how much the damage was, I'm going to send you a bill. It's because you pay the woman's salary doesn't mean you can come in and wreck my place. Good morning, Ben. What did he mean, pay my salary? Oh, look, it doesn't, it doesn't amount to anything. Well, wait a minute. All it amounts to is that you are paying my salary. Isn't that it? Uh, no, that is not it at all. Oh. Julia, please believe me. The only Mr. reason Mr. I did... Grandma? Get upstairs and pack your bags. We are getting out of here immediately. Right, I Julia, please listen to me. I thought we were going to stay You anymore. heard me. Get up and pack your bags. I'm humiliated. I've never been so humiliated in my I thought I was doing the right thing. Guess it's no use pretending anymore. You know how I feel about her. Why don't you go up top, Gore? Oh, yeah. What am I going to say? I'll talk to her. Oh, it's not going to do any good. Pa, now's not the time. That's what I need some time if I just had a few days so I could talk to her, explain to her why I did those things, how I feel about her. Well, I know how to keep her here if you're really interested. Yeah, how's that? Edwin Booth. He's going to be in town in a couple of days. Talk to him and see if I can't set up a private reading for her. I'm sure she'll be glad to stick around for that. Yes, I believe she would. Well, you know, I know she would. Better give me the few days. That's what I need. Go tell him. Go ahead. Thanks, Adam. You know what's going to happen in that reading, don't you? Well, if she isn't any good, he'll say so. Booth's that kind of a man. 
She ain't got to be on the stage. She's got to find out sooner or later. A little rough on her. Adam! What? Well, all my life I've been hoping for something like this. Are you sure you can arrange it? Yes, I think so. Uh, uh, Mr. Booth and his manager, Mr. Forrester, are going to be in Virginia City in the next couple of days, and... Uh, well, I think we could work out something if you're really interested. If I'm really interested? Well, just to get the chance. A, a private audition with Mr. Booth and Mr. Forrester? Why, why, that could mean the difference between years of waiting and success. That's true. I think you'll find they're both very fair people. Oh, Adam, I don't know how to thank you. Your stay is thanks enough. Oh, that's for you and for all your wonderful sons. <laughs> Mom, I'm all packed. Well, you can just unpack it. We're staying. Oh, whoa! That's the way to do it, little buddy. Hey, man. That's real good, Tom. Audition. Well, I don't rightly know. Tommy, I reckon it's something pretty important, though, because your mama sure puts a lot of story in it, don't you? Indeed, a wonderful effort, young woman. A wonderful effort. Very interesting. Very. Oh, thank you. You don't know how much I appreciate this opportunity. It's been our pleasure, Julia. You see, we, uh, we don't know what plays we're going to do until we reach San Francisco, so I... Uh, we can't promise anything at the moment. Oh, I understand that, Mr. Forrester. Oh, Joe. Oh, I feel like wide open space, like, like conquering the world. Will you take me for a drive, please? I'd love to take you for a drive. <laughs> I'll freshen up a bit. Oh, gentlemen, please, forgive me. Won't you have a brandy? Oh, thank, thank you, Mr. Conway. Quite pleasant. There we are. Well, Edwin, I never thought I could be so wrong. You're not wrong, Adam. Oh, what do you mean? Adam, you've known me for a long time. And you know that the one thing I cannot be dishonest about is my regard for professional standards. But the way you looked, the way you talked, I, th I thought you liked her. Your brother Adam asked us to be kind, no matter what the verdict. Well, what is the verdict, gentlemen, in so many words? To be frank, Mr. Cartwright, Julia has more than her share of beauty. But as a dramatic actress, she is distressingly bad. I hadn't thought about how much this had hurt her. It's not going to be easy to tell her. In a week or two, I, I'll write to her and I, I'll let her down lightly. Thank you, sir. I think we'd better get back to town. Thank you very much for coming out. Thank you. Goodbye, Mr. Cartwright, Forrester. Who is it? It's Joe. Come in, Joe. Yes, I heard. Well, you know what's bothering them. Professional jealousy. Oh, that Booth. He's afraid to see anybody else come along with talent. Look, I know you must feel if... if there's any way I can help you, if there's anything no. I can do. But I'll show them. Oh, boy, I'm going to show all of you. You're going to go ahead with your plans. You're going to go to San Francisco. You bet I am. And I'm going to be a big success. You can tell your Mr. Edwin Booth that. Well, all right, then. Well, maybe there's some way I can help you if, if you need any money or no, something. No, no, no. Thank you very much. I am perfectly able to take care of myself and Tommy. 
Yes, even to the point of paying you back that salary you gave Mr. Larkin. I'm going to go to work for him at regular pay. Oh, he'll hire me. He knows a good attraction when he sees one. Well, at least you'll be in town. I'll get to see you once in a while. Oh, you can see me anytime, starting tonight. Why, you just come down to Mr. Larkin's fancy saloon and pay for a table. <laughs> Where have you been? Just stopped over the hotel, make sure Tommy was all right. Oh? Well, what, what's he doing? Well, he's in there playing checkers with a desk clerk. What's he making out? Beating the pants off him. Figures. <laughs> Joe, Miss Grant, we'll see you now. Right. I'll see you later, Pa. <laughs> Julia, it's Joe. Come in, Joe. Hi. Joe, I just wanted to say I'm sorry. Oh, sorry for what? You had every right to be angry at all of us. Dear Joe, you know I sounded like a fool yesterday. You never sound like a fool to me. You know... It's a funny thing, but I guess I've always known that what Mr. Booth and Mr. Forrester said was true. But the more I failed, the more I tried, and the more determined I got, till I built myself such a life of lies, I, I couldn't let go. Oh, how do you know? You never tried. You know, it's really not so bad. There's lots of things in this life besides the stage. Lots of things. Oh, I've wanted to love you from the first moment I saw you. But I was afraid it might interfere with my dream world of the theater. Can you honestly see yourself waiting outside of stage doors in, in Sacramento, Brownsville, Omaha, first night stands halfway across the country? Oh, why Can talk about something that's not going to happen? Something that's all in the past. It is in the past. Mr. Booth finally made me accept that. Oh, Joe, if you really want me. I want you. I want you more than anything else in the world. Julian, time for your next number. Everybody's waiting. She heard you, Jim. Yeah. Got great timing. <laughs> Say after your song. Oh, I love you. <laughs> Sing good. Well, you look very happy. Yeah, I am. Any particular reason? I'm gonna ask Julia to marry me tonight. Don't worry, everything worked out fine, too. She's through with acting. Congratulations, little girl. Thanks. Friends, here she is again, the pride of Virginia City, Julia Grant. Well, here comes the attraction of the evening. Beautiful attraction indeed. I'm a girl who's got an ailment. To recover, there's no chance. My dear old family doctor found there's nothing he can lance. The poor man tried all sorts of pills and drugs distilled from plants. What lays me low? I can't say no to anything in pants. <laughs> It's because of my buckles, my shiny silver buckles on the toes of my pretty purple shoes. It's because of my buckles, my shiny silver buckles on the toes of my pretty purple shoes. Oh, my 
little silver buckles seem to give the boys a thrill. They stand and stare. I do declare I get the darndest chill. If I choose one lad to shine them, why, the rest are fit to kill. <laughs> what can I do? What would you do? I give them all their fill. <laughs> Tim Rooney was most ill-advised. We buried him today. A sweeter boy you'd never meet, but selfish all the way. They're mine, he cried, all mine, and I will fight till judgment day. For my sole right, both day and night, to save them from decay. <laughs> I'll defend with me knuckles the right to shine the buckles on the toes of them pretty purple shoes. Yes, I'll defend with me knuckles the right to shine the buckles on the toes of them pretty purple shoes. So hey there, young and handsome, if you're looking for a ball, just stroll around most any night and pay a friendly call. You may get to shine my buckles as the moonbeams on them fall. For I can't say no to friend or foe if he's handsome, dark, and tall. <laughs> you can polish up my buckles, my shiny silver buckles on the toes of my pretty purple shoes. found the leading lady for the Bohemian girl. Exactly. She'd be perfect for it. Perfect. I thought she said she was so terrible. As a dramatic actress, young man, but this gay, warm, exciting personality, this is what she's really like. Well, gentlemen, I'm afraid you're too late. That young lady has given up the stage. I have you to thank for that, Mr. Booth. I think I ought to warn you, Joseph. There's a saying in the theater, the stage gives you up. You never give up the stage. In this case, I hope for your sake that that's not true. Magnificent. Look at them. She's got them all on a string. I have something I want to talk to you about. Oh, Joe. I am the happiest girl in the world. Oh, it's so good just to have your arms around me like this. Hold me tight. Oh, you're really happy. I really am, yes. Would you be happier... Would you be happier if you knew you were going to be the leading lady in Bohemian Girl? The what? Why did you ask a silly question like that? Oh, just, just suppose it happened. What then? I am through with supposing, remember? From now on, it's reality. From now on, I'm on the other side of the footlights. As Mrs. Joseph Cartwright, I hope. It is reality. Booth and Forrester want you for the, for the leading lady and bohemian girl. Probably want you to leave for San Francisco tomorrow morning. Oh, you're making it up. No, I'm not. No, I watched them out there. They, they loved you. They thought you were the greatest thing in the world. It happened. It really happened. A leading 
lady with J.B. Forrester. We could be in the same company with Edwin Booth. Do you know what that means, Joe? That means I'll be famous. Why, there'll be pictures of me all over the country. Everybody will want to know me. Why, I'll be entertained by royalty all over the world. Joe, I didn't mean... Oh, yes, you did. No. Oh, sure you did. You're happier than I've ever seen you before. Oh, look, I don't blame you. I'm the guy that knows all about that dream, remember? Now it's come true. Well, we could go to San Francisco together. Oh. No. Well, San Francisco and Omaha and Cheyenne. Entertained by royalty all over the world. Uh, it's your life. I can't share you with the whole world. God knows I wish I could, but I'm just not that kind of guy. Well, then I'll pass it up. Joy. We'll be married and I'll be a good wife. I oh, will. Please don't try to convince yourself. Please. Oh, look, I, I know you try. It's your heart to just be somewhere else. So I have to have all your heart. I love you too much to have it any other way. Hey. Hey, look at me. Come on, where's that smile? I want you to have a smile when you go out there. I want you to be beautiful when you go out there to see Mr. Booth. You are so beautiful. Tommy insisted on coming out here to say goodbye. I don't think I'd have had the courage. Um, Joe, I still don't know how to say it. Oh, don't say anything then. Tell you, Tommy, little buddy, old Hops ain't fixed up such a good lunch here. I'm a good mind just to go with you. Thank you. Come on, Tommy. Mrs. Grant, I just want to wish you a lot of luck. Thank you, Mr. Cartwright. Goodbye, Hoss. Bye, ma'am. Bye, Hoss. Bye, little buddy. Bye. 